Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle the fire that is in us. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and see through them. Take our souls and set them on fire. Amen. Oh, good morning. Boy, it's a, it's a great day to be in church, isn't it? You know, I've been preaching a long time. In fact, I was granted a, a license to preach in an Anabaptist Church of the Brethren um, before I even had a driver's license. I preached in the slums of Kabira in Africa when the interpreter was doing a better job than I was. I would say, the Lord loves you. And he would say, Yesu Niwangu, Wowzamau, wow me, lele. I go, that guy is good. <laughs> I preached one of the longest sermons I've ever preached, understanding the expectations of a preacher in Kenya. And after 40 minutes, I concluded, and as I was walking to my seat, the host bishop said, you must be tired. I will finish. <laughs> Preached another hour and 15 minutes. Over the course of some 40 years of preaching in a variety of different contexts, I've sometimes wondered what I would say if I knew I had only one sermon left to give. Charles Spurgeon, that great 18th century evangelical preacher, used to counsel clergy to preach as a dying man to dying men, preach as if never to preach again. Now, please don't worry. This isn't any kind of announcement. I don't have a terminal illness other than the terminal condition we all live with as human beings. I have no plans to leave St. Bart's in the city of New York or the big city. Still, I do wonder if John was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, what should my voice be crying? Jesus had just one more thing to say to Simon Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. What would I want to tell you if I had only one sermon in which to do it? Well, to begin with, I'd want to say that Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate in this season of rejoicing, is worth it. Having a relationship with God through Christ is worth it. It's worth struggling through your personal doubts. It's worth dealing with the imperfections of a Christian community. How annoying are those people, right? Or a lumbering church bureaucracy. It's worth straining to listen for that still small voice of God in the midst of all the other and usually louder voices. Yes, of course, you can have a relationship with God outside of the church, but Jesus said the Christian community was the body of Christ. And in my experience, it's difficult to be in a deep relationship if the relationship is not embodied in some fashion. Most Christians find they struggle without regular contact with other believers who are on the same path. All of this is to say, perhaps inelegantly, that my relationship to God through Christ in prayer and in worship has been the most mind-blowing, unexpected, and transformative experience of my entire life. I was baptized at the age of 12 in the Church of the Brethren, and now, 53 years of baptized life later, this relationship is as deep and as sustaining as it's ever been. It's a relationship that sustained me through some really hard moments. I've had, like all of us, a few public successes, to be sure, but they often paper over a long list of private failures, all those things done and left undone. We all try to shout our successes from the rooftops when we try to bury our most difficult or painful
painful experiences altogether. But every single time I've spoken about heartbreak or grief or loss or brokenness from a pulpit, you can rest assured that I was speaking about topics with which I have had an intimate experience. And it is no joke when I tell you that I do not know what would have become of me if it were not for the presence and blessing of God in my life. I know you're thinking, we expect bishops to say such things. But if this was my last sermon, I would want you to know that. The second thing I'd want to tell you about revolves around guilt. I know feeling guilty can be a healthy thing, like an alarm that goes off when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. But there's another kind of guilt that's soul-sucking and frankly worthless, and clergy get to see a lot of it. As a priest and as a bishop, I understand and acknowledge the sanctity of the confessional. I was once subpoenaed in the hope that I would reveal pastoral information given to me by a parishioner. Fortunately, the judge in the case decided he wouldn't press the matter further, and I was excused from being asked to testify, but I was prepared to go to jail to preserve the sanctity of that confidence. So I fully understand that everything given to a priest in confession is sacred. That being said, may I reveal a general observation without revealing anything specific or confidential? Most of the confessions I've heard over the course of my ministry have been related to sexual sin. And I fully realize that marital promises are crucial and faithful commitments are the bedrock of our relationships. Our bodies and the bodies of others should be treated as temples and with respect. And that being said, I'd observe that the people I talk to are often tortured about these things. They feel like they can't be forgiven for that. Every priest can tell you about the person who spoke to them. Some party stopped them on the street because they had a collar just to ask about an adolescent sin. So I must tell you that Jesus had comparatively little to say about that. The woman caught in adultery is shown striking compassion by Jesus do we ever wonder why the man involved is never mentioned? I'm just saying. <laughs> a bishop once told me that he thought the most crucial part of Christian theology that we don't understand is related to the doctrine of the incarnation. The notion that Christ is both fully human and fully divine. Oh, we get the divine part, but it's the fully human part the sweaty, sticky, smelly, enfleshed God that we have such difficulty comprehending. If I had only one opportunity to speak with you, I would urge you to lay these burdens down. Yes, confess them all, but then believe they're forgiven and don't let them haunt you for the rest of your life. Perhaps related to this, it's the persistent anxiety so many of us carry around with us. Most of us are pretty knowledgeable about our shortcomings. We can be positively ruthless as we examine all the qualities we don't possess. And we become very vague and largely unconvinced when it comes to receiving God's grace and forgiveness. Yeah, I suppose you could preach about it too much, but I've preached about it so much primarily because I have a sense that it hasn't found a comfortable home with my listeners. I say it over and over again, you are loved. You are forgiven, you're redeemed. Because I sense that every single time I say it, someone in the back of their mind is whispering to themselves, yeah, but he doesn't know about me. He doesn't know about my sin, about my imperfection, about the things that I can't seem to get right. 
Have you ever had a coupon that you wanted to use to save money on a particular item? And when you went to use it, there was something in the fine print which didn't allow you to redeem it? It's expired. It can only be used on certain products. It was only applicable on Wednesdays between 1 and 2 a.m. <laughs> I'm sorry, it can only be redeemed at our Waco location. That's how we think about God's grace. We do. Whenever we think about claiming it, we don't actually believe it will be available to us. We feel we don't deserve it. It's in the fine print. It's just a promise that seems too good to be true. And yet, and yet, when they ask Jesus what God is like, he tells them the story of the prodigal son, really the story of the loving father, who forgives his son of the most egregious failings and restores him completely as a beloved member of the family. You are not disqualified from God's love and God's grace. You're not. I realize that there are a few people who are pretty clueless about their faults. And there are probably a few rare individuals who don't believe they've ever done anything for which they should feel guilty. But the vast majority of Christians I know are haunted by a vague sense of guilt, which I believe has absolutely nothing to do with the loving God. If I only had one shot, I'd want you to hear that. I met the artist and theologian Makoto Fujimura several years ago when uh, actually Andrew Grosso, who was the canon theologian in the Diocese of Kansas, um, invited him to deliver a Toker lecture. Well, Fujimura is a student of Kintsugi, which translated literally from the Japanese means golden repair. Kintsugi, explains Julie Poulter, is the Japanese art of mending broken ceramics with lacquer mixed with precious metals in order to restore a bowl or cup to wholeness and function while highlighting rather than masking the fractures. She writes, objects re repaired by Kintsugi masters are often stunningly beautiful veined with gold and silver or platinum that trace a history of traumatic destruction and sublime redemption. But behind each Instagram-ready bowl is a practice and a tradition that doesn't begin with the gold, but with the broken shards. Kintsugi masters sometimes hand down sets of fragments through generations, contemplating the pieces, their beauty, their patina from use, for decades before beginning the repair, which might itself take years. Fujimura says, I actually think there's a virtue in being able to see the brokenness and the fractures, as painful as they may be. This is not a cosmetic notion of beauty, he clarifies, but beauty accentuated by care of nature and our communities, beauty based on sacrifice, which I believe the Japanese aesthetic has refined. We begin with the brokenness. We begin with the shards, the memories of time when there was wholeness and functionality. Then it takes a tremendous amount of time. It's a painstaking process. The pigments are pulverized minerals and precious metals applied in multiple layers. What he describes is a slow process that fights against efficiency. Prayer and contemplation are woven into the work. The tiny mineral particles refract light, often creating subtle prismatic effects. It's a style of art made for the type of long, unforced gaze that slowly reveals ever more depth, deceptively simple and quietly extravagant. You see what's broken? 
takes time to heal. It takes patience. We can't simply see where the broken places are and slather them with epoxy. That quick fix mentality might work on porcelain, but it doesn't really work there or in life. Some breaks may be easy to repair, clean, but with others, there are fractures with run under the broken places, fault lines running beneath the surface, and healing those breaks requires deep attention and patience, love, mercy, prayer, forgiveness. This church is celebrating the 75th anniversary. 75 years of extraordinary ministry to this congregation and to the wider community, even to the world. It requires the rarest and most precious materials to heal human brokenness, up to and including Christ himself. It requires time, love, patience, and faith, and it is the work to which each of us have been summoned. Kintsugi, golden repair. When Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And a third insulting time, do you love me? He was basically erasing those three denials that Peter had made only days before. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Heal the broken parts in your life and in the lives of others. I'd really want you to know that really want you to know 